Let me read to you a passage from the ninth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. Verses 36 divided to chapter 10, verse 8. It is the Gospel for the 11th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year A. St. Matthew writes, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That's from Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 to chapter 10, verse 8, for the 11th Sunday of Ordinary Time, year A. What does it suggest to us? Well, God is all-powerful, infinitely wise, and all-knowing. That is what has been revealed. Now, one of the features of the revealed teaching of Jesus Christ is that most of its central components are beyond the power of human understanding. For instance, apart from truths, such as there being one divine being and yet three divine persons, consider God's infinity. God's infinity involves the denial of all imitation in any feature of the pure being that he is. We can grasp this denial of any limitation, but it is another matter to grasp how this is to be understood in terms of God's concrete action. God is infinite in power, wisdom and holiness. But in terms of his concrete action, how is it that the all-powerful God doesn't seem to get things done? If you were a big hulk of a fellow and you saw a person of moderate size beating up a helpless lady, would you not spring into action and prevent that assailant from doing harm? You would be able to prevent, to prevent it because of your size and strength. You had the power, and if you did not do it, then it would mean that you did not have other equally important qualities, right moral instincts and ordinary wisdom. What then is the all-powerful God doing when harm is being done to innocent people? What is he doing in allowing a Hitler, a Stalin or a Pol Pot to seize power and proceed to wreak havoc? among the peoples. Or take another form of this point. Consider simply the doing of good, let alone the, the allowing of evil. There is so much good intended by various people. There are so many good things that could be done, were there the power to do them. But what we normally find is that this doing of good is a slow and arduous work, taking time and enduring many obstacles. If there is a good, all-powerful creator, why does he not provide the wherewithal to get the good things done rapidly? That such things are within his power is manifest from, say, the miracles of Jesus Christ. He was once out in a boat with his disciples and because of his tremendous exertions was exhausted in sleep in the boat. But the problem was that during his deep and undisturbed sleep, the boat was in imminent danger of going down because of the raging storm. His disciples shook him awake, he arose, and at the word reduced the storm to absolute calm. Could not God be enabling more good to be done with this kind of ease? All this brings us to our gospel today, from Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, to chapter 10, verse 8. And in particular to one feature of it, we read that 
When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out laborers into his harvest field. Christ saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were suffering. Well, why did he not fix it all up there and then with one mighty act of power? God became man and walked the earth as our brother. Why was he not a brother to us by getting rid of all the hard things in life and make of this world a much, much more pleasant place where the crowds would not be so harassed and helpless? Further, we notice that he appealed to his disciples to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers into the harvest. But why was this necessary? Could not the divine power which Jesus Christ possessed answer that need too and at a stroke? That he had divine power is clear because he thereupon proceeded to, to bestow a share of it on his disciples. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. One of the things that is manifest in the divine plan revealed in and by Jesus Christ is that God does not dispense with the creation and its laws. God became man, and this meant respecting the human condition with its laws and limitations. As Jesus Christ hung from the cross, his enemies jeered at him. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. He could have done this, but he did not. It was not the plan of God to do things in what we see to be the quick and best way. While he gives many signs of his power and goodness by suspending the laws of creation, such as curing some lepers and raising some who are dead, this is not the usual way God works to make the world a better and holier place. When Christ's enemies demanded a sign from heaven, he sighed from the heart and left them to go to a different place. When his enemies picked up stones with which to stone him, he did not disable them by an exercise of his divine power, Rather, he hid from them and made his escape. The laws and course of our fallen world and of the ordinary life are not typically suspended. Good is done, evil is resisted, and sanctity is attained within this broken world. The plan of God is manifestly to bring immense good, good of eternal significance, out of the evil that, pass, that presses down on all, including the good man. Jesus Christ is the exemplar of what is to be expected and aspired for in life. Let us never be disillusioned by the sadness and frustration of life. Let our model, when faced with suffering, with evil, and with the difficulty of doing good things, be Jesus Christ, whose great work was accomplished precisely in suffering, difficulty, and frustration. Let us work as Christ wanted his disciples to work, ever praying that the Lord of the harvest will send more laborers into his harvest.